So I was trying to think about the best way to do Pod Plus today because I was thinking I listened to the live episode and I thought, well, I don't want to just repeat that. So what I thought I would do is for each of the six chapters, ask you which one feels most relevant for you right now. Go through them each in turn with one bit of wisdom from one of our guests and one tool to try out. So I hope that structure feels like that'll that'll make sense. Um, oh, you've got your personalised books through. Oh, good. I'm glad. And I hope they're all arriving safely. Um, let us know if they're not. Maybe not right now, but, but definitely do let us know. So six chapters of the book for those of you who can do annotation. So we've got resilience, time, relationships, self-belief, oops, self-belief, progression, and purpose. And let me know using the annotation, if you're not on the move and you, you can use the annotation, use the stars to just to show me of those six chapters, of those six topics, um, if you are reading the book or if you're going to read the book or if you're just going to listen to the podcast, where do you want to start? Where's the most important one for you? Which is the most important one for you to think about at the moment? Okay. Um, Tiff saying time, time, yeah. I'm always really fascinated. One of the things, if you, if you have got the book and you've not started it or you're planning to get the book, you don't need to read it in order. We have tried really hard to write it in a way where you can go to what matters most to you first. So you should be able to skip straight to whichever chapter feels most useful. The how to coach yourself chapter at the start is quite helpful in terms of some tools and techniques that apply across every chapter. But I'd still hope if you were thinking, I want to skip that and go straight to resilience or self-belief, um, you should be able to. Only one vote for relationships. What, what feels like the most popular? I'm just trying to do it by eye a little bit. So we've got lots of early votes for purpose, self-belief, purpose. A few more people coming, time. I mean, the good thing, the thing I find reassuring, perhaps apart from relationships, is that they have all got some stars, which means that hopefully we've covered some of the right topics. Um, their relationships look like it's um, not going to be as popular initially. I'd also be really interested, if you are reading it, let us know if there's any topics you think we've missed out. I mean, obviously we won't just write into the book, but what we can do is think, well, are there other resources that we might create? Are there tools that we might do is there a podcast episode missing because there is I won't I mention it because I don't want to sort of lead everyone there was one chapter we I sort of wrote and then we took out and there was one chapter we didn't write because we felt like we sort of covered it and we were a bit like oh we're not sure we're the experts on it so I'm always interested to know what gaps we've got as well if there are areas you want to coach yourself on and we're not we're not providing that content or those tools that you were looking for um uh you like the circle we're going to talk a bit about that Helen yeah the relationships chapter I'm glad that's working plus Helen and I had loads of arguments about that chapter so we're actually really proud of it because we, it probably is the chapter we spent the longest on uh, I wrote a version Helen wrote a version I wrote a version Helen wrote a version that is not the way to write a book um but we got there in the end so let's go through each of them pretty quickly talk about what it is and one quick tool to try out so Resilience, how you respond when things don't go to plan. And if you listen to Lee talking about resilience, he talks about this idea of the lamppost became a big milestone. And that's because for him, if you've not listened to it yet, um, Lee actually had to relearn to walk again. He's a really inspiring guy. Uh, Lee Chambers, if you actually want to really listen to his story, I would listen to the Sideways podcast that Matthew Syed does because he has a whole episode. So he is really worth kind of getting to know better and you learn a lot more about his resilience than in sort of the very short excerpts that you heard in the podcast. And we talk about this idea of resilience reserves. Build your resilience reserves up now so they're there when you need them. And so as I go through these six, think about for you a red, amber, green rating. So if you're thinking about where your resilience reserves are right now, red, amber, green for each of these six areas. So are you looking after your world outside of work? So on all of those other things that are important to you. Are you resting and recovering along the way? Waiting until you sort of get to that point of where you fall off a cliff and then feel like you really need to rest. Are you doing it continuously? Are you actively resting? Are you uh, celebrating, shining a spotlight on your successes? The small ones, the medium ones, the biggest ones. Have you got the right support in place? 
Do you ask for the help that you need as you go? It doesn't always have to be a cry for help. It can be a different point of view, a different perspective. And are you creating an environment of optimism? Again, let me know using the stars, which is the one of those for you that feels the most red at the moment? Which is the one that you think that's the one I need to do the most work on to build up my resilience reserves right now? Stars, hearts, all good. Let me know. Support, so thinking about the support systems that you might need. If you've not listened to the personal board um, podcast episode, that really helps with support for resilience, I think. It's a good one to listen to. So a bit of a mix. So the whole point here is we don't need to wait for something to go wrong to then think about our resilience. The best thing that you can do is take continual small actions and be thinking about, have I got those resilience reserves to a good place so that when things do get hard, which sometimes we can't anticipate and we, we don't expect, all these things are sort of where we need them to be, or at least some of them are, and we can start to spot the gaps that we've got. So one quick thing on resilience to get us going. Next one, this really stuck with me. Of anything in the episode, this is the thing I think I would remember. So when we talk about time, we're talking about how you can take control of your time at work. And one of the things that Adrienne said was free time doesn't equal availability. Um, and I think I do have this mindset anyway, but I think Helen would find this much harder because it's almost like, oh, you've got a free slot in your diary. You've got a free hour at the end of the day. And that doesn't mean that then, oh, you can fill that with meetings. You can fill that with more work. You might fill that with, uh, as I'm going to do later this afternoon, going for a walk. You might fill that with spending time with your friends. You might fill that with listening to a podcast, reading a book. And I, I just really like that free time doesn't equal availability. Um, just think it's a it's a really memorable way to think about time. And one of the things that we talk about in the book is this idea of time trade-offs. And I think this is really important. So if you want to spend more time on something, acknowledging and recognizing, then that means you need to spend less time on something else. And this is where I think visuals and circles can be really useful. So if you think, well, I feel like my work feels about this big at the moment and I'd like it to feel this big I want to sort of reduce the amount of time I spend on the work on on, on how much I work the amount of time I dedicate to work then then what is the then what are you going to do to kind of make that difference and also what do you want to spend more time on so if you want to spend more time this is attorney general Quick reminder to go on mute if you're not already. If you want to spend more time on active rest, if you want to spend more time, I don't know, with your friends or reading a book, whatever it might be, then what are you going to reduce? So I always think of this in sort of circles, um, whatever this might look like for you. So I might think, okay, well, my current circle of, let's say, play, if you wanted to use that phrase, or actually I want to use a different colour, might look like this. I sort of want it to look like this. And then therefore, what's what circle needs to get smaller? So always think about this as a kind of a um actually I was interviewing Steph who is the founder of Don't Buy Her Flowers this week for a podcast in the future and one of the things that she said um again which is the same sort of comment is we add when it comes to time we want to spend more time on something so what we actually do our default is often add it on add it on to our days just it becomes another thing whereas I think we want to get away from adding and into subtracting you've got to subtract from somewhere not just keep adding it on because if we have that idea of just adding on you probably either get burnt out if you actually succeed in adding it on or you don't ever make the change that you want to make so think about those time trade-offs for you you can look at this through a few different lenses you can go quite big as I've described there like work versus um you know free time to do your hobbies or work versus family time or you can break down work so you could just look at work and think if I want to spend more time on this kind of work or this sort of project, then I need to spend less time on X sort of work. And so actually you can you can sort of zoom out and go quite big and think about the big chunks of time you have in a week, or you can go quite small. You could take just your work and break that down. So a few ways to look at that. So let's talk a bit about relationships. Um, this is another quote from Adrian. She said, I'm curious and I've created my own family. I'm the ultimate encourager. And I thought that was a really nice phrase, this idea of being the ultimate encourager. And in the book, we basically steal an idea from a guy called Robert Dunbar, who talks a lot about the amount of relationships that we can successfully build at any one point 
in our lives and we then sort of apply that to our careers what does your career community look like and we call it we have three sort of circles and these numbers um you know don't take these as exact numbers but they're sort of a good guide they're a good steer which is i think we we want to have about five what we describe as confidants so these are the people who know you really well who are probably friends they're probably people who what you've worked with before but they're friends they're the people who they're the first people you tell good news to they're the first people that you would go to um if you needed some support or you're having kind of a hard time so who are those five people and one of the questions that we ask in the book and just make sure you say thank you to those people because they play a big part in supporting you they're constantly on your side they are probably your biggest encouragers then thinking about here with your 15 so it was a bit of a rubbish color sorry on there who is your who makes up your career council so this is where you sort of get to the personal board idea and in the book you'll see we sort of ask you to all the people to make sure that you've got a range of support in terms of the council think of this as your kind of your board 15, have you got challengers, empathizers, questioners, ideators, connectors, and, and almost plot those people and look at the range of those people. Because if they all bring a very different skill set, that's a really good thing. If they're all very similar, you get the risk is you get stuck in an echo chamber trap of people a bit like you and who probably think like you and sound like you and have got similar experiences to you. So worth thinking about who are your five, who are your 15? Obviously, sometimes those people overlap and we sometimes get asked that question, but it's quite good to not have too many overlapping people because we don't want our development to be too dependent on the same people. It's quite useful to, you might have one confident who you also think is on your council, but you might have a couple who are not. So we don't need to be too binary about it, but we do want to encourage ourselves to think sort of beyond these being the same people. And then the last one, which is your 50, this we describe as your connections. So these are the people, you've got weaker ties for people who've listened to the Strong and Weak Ties um, episode. People who you don't see as much, who don't know you as well, but perhaps you are in a network with them. Perhaps you're learning with them. Some people that you know at work that you're connected to. But the point we make here is you are still, um, you still should be acting in these connections. So we shouldn't just assume that just because we work with somebody um, in the past that that connection is going to sort of stay active. We have to sort of decide what do those 50 connections look like? Um, and we do a mind map in you Coach U to kind of help you think about those 50 connections. People you work with today, people you're connected with in your industry, out of your industry, who, who are those 50 people and how are you going to stay connected to them? What does that look like for you? If you're an introvert like me, um, that often means sort of I, I'm quite one to one in how I build relationships. But there, you know, if you're more extrovert, often if you can think of a way of connecting with more than one person at once, that's a really smart thing to do. So there's sort of the one to one approach and then there's the one to many approach. And I was doing a workshop yesterday where I mentioned a guy I know called James Watley um, does a really smart thing where he has a newsletter on a Friday called Five Things on a Friday. And it's a really, he's a really good writer. It's sort of techie strategy based, neither of which I work in anymore, but I would always read it because I always learn something new. I'm curious about it. And I really like his style. He's quite self-deprecating. He's quite funny. I sometimes skip past the computer game section because I think I'm not that, that interested in that bit. But what James does there is he is connecting with, I'm sure, more than 50 people every Friday by doing that. And he's very much like, I want to be in conversation with everybody, respond, get in touch with me, tell me what you're thinking. So that's a really good example of one to many. One to one would be doing what I do, which is one of the ways of building my outer circle is every month I say yes to a curious career conversation with somebody new. I set myself a goal of one new person every month. And if I didn't do that, I would just spend time with the same people. So sometimes it won't feel like a priority but I'll notice that someone's interested in having an exploratory chat about something. Maybe they've got in touch because we've been connected in the past. And I will think, well, that's probably not top of my list right now in terms of my day to day. But that will help me do that thing that Margaret Heffernan says so brilliantly, which is build relationships beyond the ones that we need right now. We need to spend some time outside, build relationships outside of our day to day role. So I find 
um, taking Dunbar as a bit of inspiration and then we've sort of made it our own. Um, I hope if you looked at it, he wouldn't think it. we've gone sort of gone too far off the mark. But we've then really thought about you and your career community. What does this look like for you? So maybe just think about where is your focus right now? Because we can't do all of these things at the same time. Is it here? Is it here or is it there? And just think about maybe is it the one that you've neglected a bit or you've just not spent as much time on so far this year? And then what might you do next? What would your like first action be if that's the area you want to spend a bit more time on? Mine's here. And I've actually just joined a network specifically for people who run their own companies. Um, and there's a whole group of people there that I don't know, that I've not met. Um, and I've, I'm kind of going, oh, I want to sort of put myself in some new places with some new people. But I've not done a very good job yet this year of prioritizing that. Um, but I'm going to something next Thursday, which is going to be like my, which will always make me nervous as um, an introvert. But but so far, everyone's been very friendly. So I'm sort of looking forward to that. Right, self-belief. We are going to do a quick quiz. Let me just find the right page. I'm probably being a bit ambitious about what we can cover in one morning, but I, could, I couldn't work out how to decide which chapter to get rid of. So I was like, we're going to have to do all six. So we are going to do a quick um, thinking about building your kind of your wall of self-belief. And one of the things that James from Sanctus said in the podcast episode was kind of having this attitude of sometimes What's the worst that can happen? And when we do that scenario planning, sometimes it actually helps to build our self-belief. And I think if you review what you think, say and do, you can figure out what is getting in the way of your self-belief. So either just be doing this alongside me in your head or scribble it down if you can, or if you've got the book, you might have already done this. This is just thinking about where do you feel good about your belief and what gaps have you got? And where you feel good, we shade in the brick and where you're not feeling quite so good or you feel like it's a gap, we leave the brick unshaded. So question one, uh, do you think you've got the ability to do your job well? Or do you sometimes think that you're not enough in some way? So if you feel like you've got the ability to do your job pretty well, you feel kind of confident in your abilities, you sort of shade in the brick. So I feel good about what we do most days, not every day. Question two, do you make your own mind up about what you think about yourself? Or... Do you worry about what other people think of you quite a lot? And actually, I feel quite good about that one. I'm quite confident in my own view of myself. Um, albeit when someone writes a really bad review of the book on Amazon, I still get really upset. <laughs> so question three, do you think about your strengths and how you can make them stronger? Or do you worry about your weaknesses and the mistakes that you make? I'm going to leave that one blank because I don't think I think enough about how to make my strengths stronger. I think I know my strengths but I'm not active enough at the moment about growing my strengths. Moving on to say, do you think, do you say you can, or I can do that, but I need to still figure it out more than you say I can't. So when you're saying I can't do that, maybe you're thinking that, whether it's you're saying it to yourself or whether you're saying it to other people. I like to think in the main, I'm pretty growth mindset because I spend a lot of time thinking about it. So kind of that I can mentality, I can, and we just need to find a way. Question five, um, when somebody praises you, do you say thank you and feel good about the difference that you make? Or do you dismiss it as it, it's not true and people are just being nice? Does your inner critic kick in before your inner coach? Um, I feel quite good about that one. When people say um, we've done a good job and they appreciate it, I think thank you. And that does make me feel really proud. Um, six, do we say no when we need to, which is a good thing? Or do you say yes when you would like to say no? I still sometimes say yes when I should say no. I'm better than I was, but I want to work on that a bit more. Leave that one blank. Number seven, do you spend time with people who boost your belief? Or do you spend time with people who make you feel worse about yourself? I'm very lucky there. I spend lots of time with people who make me feel good. Do you share and celebrate your successes? Or do you find it hard to know the impact that you make in your job? Sometimes I actually do find it hard to see the impact of what we do. I'm going, to, I'm going to leave that now because there's some things mulling around in my mind about, about that and being able to do a better job of that. And then nine, do you spend some time doing things you've not done before? Or do you spend most of your time in your comfort zone doing things that feel very familiar? Mm, I'm going to leave that one blank. I think I could probably stretch myself even further there. So the idea there, which we've done very quickly, that's probably a whole half an hour in itself. But it's trying to think about how your thoughts how what you say to yourself and to other people and how your actions all work together to build your belief 
or at times, if they kind of work together in, in a bad way, they can actually diminish your belief as well. And it's helpful to think about what are you doing to build your belief and what are you doing that might get in the way of building your belief? Hopefully a good, a good at least starter insight into that exercise. So thinking a bit about progression, um, and there we heard Drew talking about success is not linear because life is just not like that. And Drew, he's, um, he's a great guy. He's really, really funny. Um, he's really good to spend time with. Three things to think about on progression that I find really useful. First one, involve, don't solve. So don't feel like with your progression, when you're trying to move forward with momentum, which is how we describe it, you don't have to come up with all the answers yourself. Involve people in it who can give you ideas and their perspective. Sometimes we can think we need to have all of the solutions for ourselves. And then having that, your commitment creates commitment. Don't turn up and just to a conversation and not be clear about the help that you need. I once had a brilliant mentor. I had the opportunity to have a brilliant mentor and turned up and she very quickly said to me, how can I help you, Sarah? And I just thought, I've not thought about that. I'm so happy you're spending time with me. I've not really invested in thinking about how this can be helpful. So don't make that mistake. Be committed, be really clear on what you think first, and then make sure that your kind of your support system is helping you to fill in the gaps or giving you a point of view or a perspective. And you will occasionally, and it happens in everybody's squiggly career, you get those knots that feel like you can't untangle them. There are constraints that are outside of your control. When those constraints come your way, remember Adam Morgan's work. Um, he, wrote a, he wrote a small Ask the Expert section in the book, which is brilliant, really well written because he's a brilliant writer. So read that section. And the thing that he talks about is in those moments, we need to have a stubbornly adaptive mindset. Know what to let go of, know what to hold on to. Th really think about going, you've got to sort of accept that constraint, but it doesn't mean that you kind of let go of the thing that's important to you. We need to approach those constraints with curiosity, with a growth mindset. We need to think, well, I can still do that if, or how might I ask some really good propelling questions. Um, I'm a big fan of his work and it has really helped me actually with the work that I do as well as my development over the past couple of months. Last one. Purpose, sense of direction and meaning. Loved this from Lee, um, a really practical thing he said, have a go at writing your own script in the third person. So that would be um, going maybe fast forward to, to a couple of years time and write what you want to be true about the work that you do in third person. So you'd say, well, Sarah, um, if I was doing this a few years ago, I would have said, oh, well, Sarah did a TED talk um, and people watched it and shared it in their organizations. And, it's, and it meant that more and more people we could share squiggly careers with more and more people. We could scale our idea of squiggly. So that's all you're trying to do. No one ever needs to read it, but there is a lot of evidence from a guy called James Pennebaker about how the impact of writing our own story. Um, a for self-belief. We actually talk about it about self-belief, but also in terms of purpose. And do your own purpose mind map. So just spend a bit of time in an environment that you think is going to help your thinking and where you can sort of be creative and just think about who and what inspires you. What are you really passionate about? What, what is the difference you want to make? What are you curious about? What do you want to learn about? And if you're 90 sitting on a park bench, what do you want to be true about the life that you've led and the work that you've done? It's also sometimes really helpful to ask, and we talk about this in the book, the exact opposite questions. What gets you angry? When are you at your most frustrated? What really annoys you? What would you be really, what change, if, if what change that doesn't happen would really kind of, would really disappoint you? So you can sort of do this from a few different angles and we give you loads of ideas of the questions in the book, but this gets you, gets you started. Um, and you can just, if you don't need to read the book, you could just listen to an episode on purpose. But remember with purpose, it's about work in progress per, uh, purpose. There is no such thing as a kind of a perfect purpose statement. And to finish, and we've just about got there, um, I just picked out one of my favorite advice from all areas, which is from Kath Bishop, who was an incredible supporter of our book um, in terms of introducing me to people and gave me the best critique of the book that I've seen so far. 
Um, I remember reading it. I was on holiday and she sent me this email with just all the ins and outs of what she loved and her even better ifs. And it was so good. She's um, so great. If you ever need someone in your, to come into your organization to talk about the long win and success, she's brilliant. And she says, being curiosity led brings a kind of courage. And essentially her point is that that has helped her to squiggle in all sorts of directions and let go of this idea of there is a right move or a right choice that we can make. So I hope that's been helpful. I know we have covered a lot this morning and I'm really sorry I've not been able to keep an eye on chat at the same time. Um, I sort of had to make a choice about six chapters or being able to see the chat. Um, and like I say, I'm so I'm so attached to all of the chapters. I, I couldn't let go of any of them. So I know you will have all um, helped each other in the chat. I hope this morning's been useful. Um, thank you all so much for continuing to come and support us and support you, Coach You. And we'll see you next week where we are talking about how to deal with disappointment.